Okay, we're on the ninth commandment, or not the ninth commandment, the ninth week of our look at the Ten Commandments for the 21st century. We were looking actually at the second commandment. Don't make any images of me, or don't make any graven images of me, says the Lord. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. And keep my commandments. So many surveys have shown that uh, people don't know the Ten Commandments or think if they know them they think they're out of date. I don't believe that at all. I don't think they're out of date. I think they are just as important to us Christians now as it was to the people that God gave them to many thousands of years ago. We've been looking at this poll from U YouGov that came out about a couple of years ago and uh, you shall not worship idols comes down at number seven in the, the list with only 31% of people believing that it's still important. Uh, people who believe that uh, you shouldn't worship statues or symbols. Even Christians are split on it when they're asked particularly about this commandment. Only 43 people say that it's important and 44% saying it's not much important at all. So there you go. It's one of those commandments that people are not too much interested in. but it is important that we realize that we can't worship a God like people worship other gods like idols. God is not a person of wood, metal or stone. You see, the, the Ten Commandments are not just bare guidelines of how we should live in our world, but they are a means for people who love God to understand God better. By knowing the commandments, it helps us to understand what he thinks. Because we are created in his image. And through these commandments, we are asked to honour and to keep these laws. Now, you may not think idols are much important these days. Well, Maybe not the wooden ones, the stone and the metal ones that some religions worship today. But remember, the Israelites themselves came from a world full of idols. When, led them, when Moses led them out of Egypt, they would have been familiar with idols that were worshipped by the Egyptians. And that had been their life for many years. So this second com commandment deals very much with the vital issue, not so much about who God is, but what God is not. Remember, we're following J. John's book, The Ten Commandments, The Ten, and he says this, when we think of idols and idolatry, our minds conjure up pictures of statues in exotic Far Eastern temples. For most of us, though, bowing down to some carved piece of wood or stone seems illogical, unattractive and rather ridiculous. We smile at the thought. No, we say, that's not one commandment you'll ever see me breaking. But the problem is most people these days don't know the commandments. 
as J. John says in his book, you know, a couple of generations ago, it had been ludicrous writing a book on the Ten Commandments because most people would have known and understood them and thought to have kept reasonably to them. And of course, that's not true today. Most people outside regular churchgoers, I suspect, and perhaps even some regular churchgoers would not be able to give you what the Ten Commandments are all about or repeat them, certainly. But they are certainly important to Christians today and still important in our world. Our God is in the heavens, and he does as he wishes. Their idols are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak and eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, and noses but cannot smell, they have hands but cannot feel, and feet but cannot walk, and throats but cannot make a sound. And those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. Well, the problem today is that people do worship idols, not perhaps in the same way that they did during the Old Testament times, but we see several times in God's word throughout the Old Testament, people like this psalm are reminded that they shouldn't worship idols and they constantly did. Even people like King Solomon, who was regarded as the most wisest man on earth at the end of his life started worth worshiping idols to please his wives not a good thing. We often worship idols of those whose peers we are accountable to. So I think that perhaps the biggest danger to us today surrounding idolatry is our preconceptions that prevent us seeing all sorts of things as modern day idols. They may not be statues, but they certainly come under the heading of idols. In fact, some of our perhaps most powerful idols exist only in our mind. Human understanding is a workshop where idols are continually being crafted in all different sets and forms. Idolatry has been around and is still around. But perhaps it's difficult for us to comprehend what an idol is these days. You know, we know that God is not a person of wood or metal or stone. That's simple. But what's an idol? What about this incident then? In uh, the book of Numbers. Moses and the bronze serpent. Let's relive the story from the scripture. Oh they travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go round Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. So clearly in this incident in the wilderness, about two years, I would imagine, into their, their journey to the promised land, they had this problem that uh, God sends some snakes into the camp because the people were moaning and groaning. And uh, some people died. And so the people appealed to Moses about this. Moses prays and God says, well, make 
this snake on a pole. Is that an idol? It looks to me that it could be an idol. And Moses fashions it out of wood and bronze and sticks it up in the middle of the Israeli camp. And if they get bitten by snakes, they can look at it and they won't die because these snakes were poisonous. It's a very strange story on the face of it. I mean, why didn't God, if he was forgiving the Israelites, just get rid of the snakes? And instead of letting the snakes bite in them, they didn't have, would have to pray for healing. But perhaps God wanted them to pray for healing. But it clearly looks to me like although they weren't supposed to worship this stick, this snake, whatever we want to call it, it is a bit of an idol, isn't it? What is really going on there? I mean, if we look at the commandment itself, I think the key phrase in this commandment is you shall not bow down to them or worship them. It's not a question of making images that may present our gods, but it's the worshipping of the images that really upsets God. And this is the key. It's not fashioning or making an idol that offends him. It's the bowing down and worshipping. That's the problem. Because we still got some people think we have idols in our churches today, especially in the sort of Catholic churches. I mean, what about crucifixes? They're always at the centre of Catholic worship. Christ on a cross. Is this an idol? Some, of course, people from the reformed churches wouldn't have anything like crucifixes up on walls that people might consider your worship in. I can remember when I was with my Christian hiking friends many years ago when we was doing having a whole week's hike around the, the mountains of Snowdonia going into the local church in uh, I can't remember some little small village it's only a small church there's only about 20 30 people there and we our group was about 15 strong we went in there so we almost doubled the congregation and I can always remember the person who took the service it was a very straightforward service and uh, staying up that saying if we, the, the people who wanted to cross up on the wall would be over his dead body I mean it was must have been quite embarrassing for people but people even in the evangelical tr protestant tradition can get het up about crosses and crucifixes and I mean it's even in some Catholic churches, the, the crucifix is right high and central, difficult to avoid. Are these images, are these idols that we worship? I mean, even in our Anglican Protestant churches, you know, we have paintings or glass windows in a prominent place that we can't fail to look at, this is All Souls, Langham Place, opposite the BBC, a very well-known uh, modern church. But, you know, the centre piece that your eyes, I've been in there, attracted to the painting. Can't remember who paints it now, but it's called the Behold the Lamb. Do people worship that? Do they look at Jesus and worship his form? I mean, you know, we're all familiar with these type of Buddhas and other idols from the East and do filtrate into our land now, especially in gardens, I've noticed, because I live with a lot of Hindus around where I live. There's lots of Buddhas by front doors and everything else. 
But are these these are idols clearly, and people do worship them. But the Christian church is not without its idols that we can worship. So being an what an idol is isn't all that clear. I think in J. John's book, he comes up with a simple suggestion about how we can deal with idols. What isn't an idol? The way that we can keep ourselves from worshipping idols. He asks us these questions. Can you make these statements without hesitation, he says. God gives me purpose, meaning and fulfilment in my life. God governs the way I act. God is the focal point around which my existence hangs. God is often in my thoughts and I get enthusiastic about God. I desire more of God. Thoughts of God comfort me when I'm feeling down. I read about God. I talk about God. I make friends with those who are committed to God. Is this something that we should desire? Can we all make these statements without hesitation, without having to think about them too much, that would tend to think that we are not worshipping an idol that is our God? Idol worship will damage our relationship with God. Isaiah points that out in his one of his speeches, um, sermons. All those who make idols are worthless and the gods they prize so highly are useless. Those who worship these gods are blind and arrogant. They will be disgraced. It's no good making a metal image to worship as a god. Everyone who worships it will be humiliated. The people who made I make idols are human beings and nothing more. Let them come and stand trial. They will be terrified and will suffer disgrace. Idol worship was big in Jewish places and communities and all through their, the existence in the Old Testament, the prophets speak out about people worshiping idols. And is it the same for us today? How do we deal with it today? Now, idols really, I think, are those things that tempt us away from an exclusive personal relationship with God. That would be my definition of what an idol is. Something that tempts us away from an exclusive personal relationship with God. And it strikes at the very foundationship of what is so important to the Christian, our relationship, our personal relationship with God. If we worship other things, then that relationship with God will be damaged. It can't be helped. Often we can relate it to the marriage relationship. Marriage relationships should be sacrosanct and if a third party gets involved in a marriage it will destroy it it destroys the stress that you need in a covenant marriage relationship and in the bible the, the bible uses strong language about what brings idols into relationships in marriages and we've all got some experience of that, I would imagine, within family. The famous statement by Princess Diana on the breakup of her marriage with Prince Charles was, there was a third person in this marriage. And we all know who that was, don't we? And that's how we should understand why God doesn't want us worshipping idols, because it will damage our relationship with him. Marriage is an analogy in scripture. We are the bride of Christ. Our life in Christ is bound up 
in the promises of the covenant that we make when we become Christians. And when we break that marriage covenant, the Bible speaks of it being like adultery. But what tends to be our idols today? Well, I've made a sort of a guess that things that tend to come into our life today that pitch up in the bracket of idols. These are not made of people type idols, but they're objects and material possessions like cars, you know, clothes, fashion, holidays, work, money, sports, fitness. All these sort of things can become idols that we could worship in our understanding of this commandment when things like our car is more important than worshipping God, when our job is more important than worshipping God, when our ability to play or follow sport becomes more important than worshipping God, when our wardrobe is more important, when our holidays become more important, all these things I would suggest are the modern idols that we particularly have to avoid and can be, that can come between us and breaking down our relationship with God. In many ways, idolatry today has got a double danger. We can try and ignore these idols that come up in our life, simply believing we can't battle against the peer culture that we are faced with these days, the peer groups we appear in, neighbourhoods, family groups or anything over else. When faced with these things, we tend to just give up. But we shouldn't. There may be an overwhelming pressure in our particular culture that we have to survive in, such as sex power possessions. We can say, oh, I just can't be bothered to fight all these things. But that would be wrong because we're not taking idolatry seriously. The second danger could be more subtle. That um, we just go along with it. One of the things that came up in my study of this is being green, replacing being godly these days. And it may be easier to get ourselves trapped between these two positions of defeatism to an overwhelming pressure from our peer culture or our unconditional rejection of things of being environmentally aware. So we need to be careful. What can we do about dealing with idolatry today? Tom Wright suggests this. He says, plant a flag for Christ. He says, when the first Christians arrived in Britain and started to build places of worship, they chose to build them on sites that the pagans had used for worship. Why did they choose to build on top of places where there had been temples and shrines to pagan gods? Was it because there was something special about those places? No, it wasn't that. Rather, it was a conscious decision to say something about Christianity, that the call to us is to worship God in places where idols are worshipped. So plant a flag for God. Plant our flags in hostile soil. Proclaim with our love of God in difficult places within our peer groups. Make it clear that we are God worshippers, that Jesus is our Lord and our salvation. I always think popular when I did my tour of the, the Holy Land some years ago, our 
Muslim guide quite clearly um, pointed out that at every Christian site, Islam built a mosque or a shrine next to it or as near to it as possible. So if you go to Nazareth, for instance, the, the church of the Annunciation, therefore the place where Mary was visited by the angels, got a big church there, but next door to it is a mosque. The church where Jesus is supposed to have been lived and brought up as a child, it's got a mosque next door to it. You know, these things happen in our society. Islam sees the point of planting things next to Christian sites. So we should be more aware ourselves that we need to plant our flags for Christ in good places. So in conclusion then, we need to remember that this commandment is in the list because our God is a jealous God. The idols of other nations are made of silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have no breath in their mouths. People who make idols will be like them, and so will those who trust them. So, God so passionately loves us that he is so severe about stopping us being involved in anything that would hurt us. If God didn't react like this in the face of such potential harm, it would show that he did not care what sort of mess we got ourselves in. So this commandment is in the list to remind us that our God is jealous, that other things will take his place <coughs> in our life. God is not jealous because he's like some wicked dictator who just wants us to do or just wants to dominate us and stop us enjoying ourselves. On the contrary, it's precisely because he so passionately loves us that he wants us not to hurt and damage that relationship that we have with him. So don't worship images of God because there's a danger there that you won't love God himself. So then next week, which will be the last week in this series, you shall have no other gods before me.